Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison, a community engagement manager for the DIA. Today, we'll be taking an inside look at the Asian galleries with veteran host Ray Henney and two new hosts, Jill Best and Frida Giblin. Jill is originally from the UK and came to Detroit with her husband in 1973, but spent five years in Singapore from 1997 to 2002, where she traveled extensively throughout Asia. On returning in 2002, she trained to become a docent at the DIA and is a former docent chair. Frida Giblin began a doc became a docent in 2015 when she retired from Wayne State University. She has enjoyed learning about the DIA's art and sharing this information with visitors. This year, she is a co-vice chair of the IPV or docent committee. In addition, she has been a member of the DIA's Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures Auxiliary since 2012. During the program, as always, I wanna encourage you to please ask questions. To do so, you can leave a public comment on this Facebook post or leave a public comment on our YouTube page. Be sure to log into your YouTube account using your Gmail. Christine Mark, Manager of Volunteer Development, will be taking your questions throughout the program. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize one of our producers, Kimmy Dobos Wolf. Today is her last day as a producer on this program. She's accepted a new position with another museum. Her contributions to this program, though, have been remarkable. She helped to shape the foundation for what it is and what it's become. She creates the PowerPoints, sets content, and always brings a smile to everyone's face. I can't thank her enough for her contribution to this program and for her contributions across the museum. Kimmy, we're going to miss you a lot and we wish you the best of luck in your next endeavor. So now I'd like to welcome Ray Henney, Jill Best, and Frida Giblin. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, we are excited to present today the first session of two sessions of a new virtual tour concerning the Asian art collection of the DIA. The DIA has an extensive collection of Asian art, which consists of over 7,000 pieces. In November 2018, the DIA opened the new Asian wing on the north side of the first floor of the museum. The Asian wing consists of five separate adjoining galleries. Kimmy, would you mind helping us out and pointing to each gallery as, I, uh, as we get to it? The first is the Chinese gallery, which is on the lower left corner. And then, you, then it opens into the Korean gallery then the Japanese gallery, which is up to, on the top. And then to the right is the Indian and Southeast Asian gallery. And finally, over to the extreme right is the Buddhist gallery, which consists of art from various Asian cultures. Those galleries display approximately 140 objects at any one time, uh, but they are periodically updated. Both modern and contemporary art is also displayed in those galleries alongside ancient and historic pieces. Those Asian galleries are nestled around a gallery dated to a gallery dedicated to Islamic art, the wonderful collection that the DIA possesses. Today, we are focusing on pieces from the DIA's Japanese and Buddhist art collections. We believe you'll find these works to be representative to be extremely beautiful in appearance and characteristic of the rich cultural heritage of the Japanese people and of Buddhism. First, we'll start with Frida, who's going to uh, discuss the Japanese pieces. Frida? Thank you, Ray. In this segment, we'll look at the paintings of Japanese artists associated with the Rinpo school. These paintings were created during Japan's Edo period from 1603 to 1838. Edo is the former name of current day Tokyo. Although the Edo period followed over 100 years of wars, 
it was a relatively peaceful time where culture and the arts thrived under Japan's warrior and samurai leaders. What's so alluring about Rinpa school art? Let me quote from a couple of DIA publications. The Rinpa artists produced paintings, calligraphy, ceramics, and lacquerware using vivid colors and bold decorative patterning. Rinpa art captures the essence of natural objects through skilled, sensitive ordering of images and space. So, Rinpa refers to a decorative style of art and is spelled R-I-N-P-A. Rinpa was named for Ogata Korin and roughly translates as School of Rin. There wasn't an actual school of painting called Rinpa, uh, and Ogata Korin wasn't the first to paint in this style. However, Korin owned works of art by two artists who were credited with making artwork in the style, Honami Koetsu and Tawaraba Sotatsu. Korin was distantly related to Koetsu, plus his family owned works by both Koetsu and Sotatsu, so he had extensive opportunities to study them. Koetsu and Sotatsu created calligraphy, lacquerware, and paintings in the late 1500s to early 1600s in Kyoto, which was the ancient imperial capital Japan. The next slide shows you a sample of their work. This painting from the early 17th century depicts a poem from the Koken Wakashu from the Heian period, which was 784 to 897. It depicts winter melon and vine silhouettes in gold and silver. The artwork was jointly created by Koetsu, who lived from 1558 to 1637, and Sutatsu, who lived from 1570 to 1640. This was probably one of a set of poems from a court anthology. Koetsu did the calligraphy and Sutatsu created the painting. What do you see about this artwork that strikes you? Does it look as if the winter melons and vines aren't quite grounded? That the calligraphy is floating in the air? Perhaps Sutatsu wants us to examine the objects closely become drawn into their beauty and imagine how the different textures of melon and vines would feel in your hand. Sotatsu is known to have depicted plants in this way, as did some other East Asian artists. Now that we've seen one of the works that might have been inspirational, let's move on to the three Rimpa artists uh, that we're highlighting today. This is Ogata Korin's fan, round fan, called the Uchiwa. And it was taken apart so you could see both sides. In this bold composition of sunlit corn and moonlit pompous grass, you can see why Korin is noted for his keen observation of nature. The top of the ear of corn has been trimmed and its leaves contrast beautifully against the gold background leaves and corn tassels blowing slightly in a mild breeze. His elegant and sophisticated painting uh, depicts a world of easy grace. Based on what you see, what do you think he might have admired in Koetsu and Sotatsu? Perhaps some of the bold patterns that aren't quite grounded? Perhaps the elegant way in which the objects from nature are presented? However, Koen didn't just copy Koetsu and Sintatsu. Koen was a prolific and versatile artist who developed a painting style that was more abstracted and simplified than the compositions of his predecessors. And as we look at the next slide, we can note the opposites that are presented, reminding us that things in nature are ever-changing, sunlight and moonlight, the light colored pompous grass contrasted against the dark sky at night and the deep green corn leaves resplendent against the sunlit sky. For each of the three Rinpoche artists 
whose works we are uh, viewing, I'd like to provide two characteristics of Rinpa. First, early Rinpa school themes were often drawn from Japanese literature and poetry. Viewers might recognize the poetry or tales which the art referenced, such as the popular tale of Genji by Lady Murasaki. This work is often referred to as the world's first novel, and the literature would contain references to nature and the seasons. Second, take a look at the use of vibrant colors applied in a highly decorative and patterned manner. Koren's art displays his talent for pattern and composition. He's particularly noted for his forceful abstract design as he worked in vivid colors or ink monochrome, often on a gold background. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Koren's background. Ogata Koren, who lived from 1658 to 1716, was raised in a wealthy textile family in Kyoto, where he and his brothers were accomplished in no theater, painting, and other arts. After the death of his father, he led an extravagant lifestyle and quickly went, th went through his inheritance. This necessitated that he work for a living. And fortunately, he was brilliant as an artist. Koren moved to Edo in 1704 and became the foremost decorative painter of the Edo period. His art bridged the worlds of the old aristocratic imperial city of Kyoto and the Tokugawa shogunate's brash new bourgeois military capital at Edo. Besides making fans, he created designs for garments and ceramics, collaborating with his brother Kenzin. They were both famous during their lifetimes, selling to the merchant class, educated professionals, and elite samurai. See one of the decorative objects uh, in the next slide. Um, and this next slide shows a box for writing implements. <clears throat> it's made of lacquer, gold, mother of pearl, and lead on wood, although some experts believe it is silver that is tarnished and not lead. <clears throat> Ray, by the way, um, I heard that some of the French Impressionists uh, were influenced by Japanese art. How, how do you think they might have been influenced by Corin's art? Well, probably uh, his art with respect to nature and showing that those corn stalks. Hey, could you go to the next slide, Kimmy? Right. This is going to be a good example of it. Um, so um, Van Gogh was very much influenced by Japanese paintings and Japanese prints that he saw, and he actually owned some Japanese prints. And this particular painting is influenced by two aspects of Japanese um, uh, art. One directly related to what you were just describing. You had the corn stalks and the pappas grass and that sense of breeze going through them that the artist created through composition. Van Gogh does this with his brush strokes in, and composition with respect to this wonderful uh, work that's uh, in the collection of the DIA, the Bank of the Waz. And you can see, and when I tour this, and maybe you've, you've done this too, Joe and Frida, is you use this as a wonderful example of his brushworks showing a sense of movement and vibration as though the limbs, the leaves are moving. And he does that simply by brushstroke. The second influence that you'll see here is the figures are unidentifiable. Uh, they have no real face. Japanese prints, particularly from the 1800s, uh, had that characteristic, and Van Gogh incorporated them here. Uh, many of the works that you'll see in the DIA's uh, Impressionist gallery, particularly French Impressionists, have this influence of particularly Japanese art, which became extremely accessible at, uh, at that time in Europe. Great. Thank you very much, Ray. That was informative. Sure. And I have to tell you, the works that you just covered are just beautiful and so delicate. They are. Uh, I love them. They're totally breathtaking. Thank you. Let's turn to our next artist, 
the painter Sakai Huitsu, who lived from 1761 to 1828. And these are just gorgeous too. In the they are. And so um, delicate and subtle in their presentation. And when they're in the Japanese gallery, there's a little seat there and you can sit, uh, there's a tokenoma nearby. Um, it's a great place to just think, sit, meditate. So the painter Sakai Huitsu, who lived from 1761 to 1828, came from a family that had been patrons of Ogata Koren. The Sakai were members of the samurai class, and both Huitsu and his older brother were versed in various arts, such as haiku and painting. Hoitsu also studied Koren's works, but instead of depicting themes from classical literature, he chose natural images, in particular representations of the four seasons. Let's take a look at these three paintings or triptychs, which depicts a branch of cherry blossoms on the right, an autumn moon in the center, and a snow-laden pine tree on the left. By the way, there's an excellent write-up of Rinpo School of Artists in the Bulletin of the Detroit Institute of Arts, volume 88 from 2014. And here's what I've learned from it. Huitsu established the Rinpo School in Edo, and his works are in what's called the Edo Rinpo style, more modern than Cohen's, but with traditional subjects such as Setsu Geka or Snow, Moon, and Flowers. He's the only Rinpa artist born into the samurai class. As an interesting tidbit, samurai, whom you may know as warriors who were experts in sword fighting, use of bow and arrow, became important patrons of the arts. Some of the uh, uh, samurai became artists themselves, participating in cer uh, tea ceremonies, uh, writing calligraphy, putting on no theater, and painting. Note the following two Rinpo themes in this triptych. First, religious beliefs played an important part in forging personal relationships with nature. Both the Buddhist and Shinto religions contributed to themes of beauty and nature with their underlying message that all things undergo change, that what dazzles the eye today has an all too brief existence. In viewing Huitsu's beautiful but short-lived cherry blossoms on the right, we're reminded that nature is in constant flux. And as we contemplate the brief existence of the cherry blossom, we might also ponder the brevity of our own human lives. In the middle painting, Moon and Clouds, the moon can be interpreted as a Zen Buddhist metaphor for truth and enlightenment. A moon, a full moon, frequently refers to an autumn moon, and often this represents the Buddha. Clouds encircling the moon might represent things that hide our true nature. To reach enlightenment, we must take away our clouds of self-deception and ignorance that hide our true nature. Second, in East Asia and Japan, many depictions of nature art incorporated symbols of virtue and upright behavior that could be interpreted by the viewer. In the snow-clad pine painting on the left, snow evokes not only winter, but as a symbol of purity. The pine in evergreen symbolizes a wise man of the highest virtue. Before we go on to uh, the next painter, uh, Christine, are there any questions that have come in? Frida, I am just loving these three screens and uh, it brings so much life to them because we see them rotated in the Japanese galleries, but you know we don't uh, stop and talk about them often. And uh, I just really enjoyed what you shared. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, I should mention that the snow-clad pine is uh, frequently offered as a holiday card. And in past years, I've purchased, purchased it from <laughs> family and friends. So it's a great piece. Yes, I love all of them. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Let's go on to um, Suzuki Kiyotsu, who uh, was Hoitsu's most no notable student. Uh, Kitsu 
is often considered the last great master of the Rinpa school and the artist who brought Rinpa into the modern era. Kyuatsu lived from 1796 to 1858, surviving Huitsu by 30 years. After Huitsu's death, Kiyitsu developed his own individual style and is best known for his folding screens or biobu. He's also celebrated for introducing a greater sense of naturalism to his representations of flowers and plants. Uh, this is one of a pair of screens and it depicts a masterful arrangement of cranes among water reeds. The cranes are shown at rest and in flight, arranged in an elliptical pattern uh, that spans both screens. Uh, in the next slide, uh, you'll be able to see both screens and the bottom screen would have been on the left. Some cranes are in mid-flight, others are preening in the reeds, together creating an exhilarating sense of movement. Kiyotsu creates a satisfying balance of realism and applies decorative touches of red, green, and blue within a predominantly monochrome palette on a shimmering gold ground. Together, these make reeds and cranes one of his most popular and exemplary works. We've heard before how viewers of Asian art would recognize the symbolism in some of the plants uh, and other images that were depicted. Cranes were said to live for a thousand years, so they became symbols of longevity. They're also uh, associated with harmony in marriage, marriage ceremonies, and birthdays. Reeds are a symbol of old age. Here are a few other takeaways in Kitsu's work. First, what were folding screens used for and how do you view these? Folding screens invented by the Chinese to avert drafts in prying eyes became an important format for Japanese painters who often created pairs of six panel screens. Time moves from right to left. So you would view each screen from right to left. The rock on the left of the second screen, and that's the screen on the bottom of the slide, acts like a period at the end of a sentence. Second, look at the amount of blank space in both screens. The blank space is an important uh, aspect of the composition. It's called ma and holds spiritual power and meaning. Ma is a pause of stillness. Here, the artist Kiyotsu created large areas of ma in the background by covering silk panels with thin sheets of gold. Now the gold provides an extra dimension to the way we conceptualize stillness because of its ability to shimmer. Think of the time before electricity when people used candles for lighting. Flickering candlelight reflecting off this gold would brighten the dim room and create an evocative atmosphere, perhaps almost spiritual, when this screen was originally viewed. Before I turn this back to Ray, uh, I'd like to thank Helen Rinsberg, president of the Cincinnati Asia Arts Society, and Catherine Kehesdorf, associate curator at the DIA, for uh, their review of this presentation. Uh, and before I close also, uh, are there any questions? <laughs> oh, actually, we, we have a visitor. My, my kitty decided to visit this presentation. Uh, we don't have any, we have some nice comments from the visitor, from our viewers, but um, not any questions. So great, thank great. you so much. I and, have a question, uh, yeah. Frida. Okay. Frida, is that a screen behind you? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, this is actually a Chinese screen. Um, it's um, Chinese screens tended to be heavier uh, and they frequently had wood inserts um, and uh, applications called caramando. Um, the Japanese screens tended to be much lighter and six panel screens would be very, very light. Um, and the Japanese created new ways of making very, very light paper. So, I mean, their screens can be very, very light um, also, here's another interesting fact that I was reading. Um, so, do you think that the painting was applied to the screen 
uh, in uh, reeds, in cranes and reeds, reeds and cranes, before uh, the uh, before or separate from when the panels were made or put together, or do you think it was painted on all the panels at once? So are you saying, was it one piece of wood, so to speak, painted and then separated, or was it separated and then painted? Um, no, I guess what I'm saying is, was it painted separately from the rest of the panels? So the panels were separate pieces oh, of wood I see, together. Um, so would they have, would the artist have painted on all the panels once the panels were made, or would the artist have painted this separately? Um, as it turns out, the artists would paint a large painting on the floor probably, and after the painting was done, special, uh, specially uh, crafted artisans or specially skilled artisans would then attach the painting to the screen that was separately made. Ah, wow. interesting. That, I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Well, thanks so much, Frida. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we're still going to be in the Japanese gallery here. And this striking contemporary work is displayed right at the entrance of that gallery. It's really captivating. Um, I often see, and maybe Jill and Frida, you do too, see visitors spending time appreciating the sculptures in a case that you can circle. And visitors often tend to examine it by going, going around. It's very striking. It's called Creature by Tomoko Kono. And she created this in 2015. It's porcelain pigments and clear glaze. This sculpture has an organic quality in an appearance of a possible combination of sea creatures, sea plants, and unidentifiable elements. You know, you have there, there this long vessel that fill, is filled with what appears to be tentacles, maybe, uh, flower petal, petals, and maybe shells. And the vessel is capped on both ends with these points that suggest a horn. And then there's various colors that are, you know, sort of dance throughout the work. Frida, I know that, and I've been told that this artist's trademark here is to put a smiley face or hide a smiley face on the sculpture. I have not been able to find it. Have you been able to find it? Well, actually, um, I heard Frank Chen tell us about finding it and spending a long time trying to find it. And it's, he said it was something like underneath. And so um, I was actually at the museum uh, this past Tuesday. I was looking all over the place, turning my head upside down, trying to find it, and I did not find it. Well, so, you know, Frank, yeah, Frank is one of our docents. And uh, Kimmy, can you go to the next slide? We have photos that Frank uh, did of it. There we go. So the one to the left with this arrow is an upside down smiley face um, that Frank took that picture. And on the right, Frank also took this picture of the artist, Kono, when she was here when this piece was first installed. And you know what, note too behind her is this samurai helmet. We'll be getting to that in just a moment. Uh, so, um, to the, to the viewers out there, if you visit the museum, uh, this is a must see and try to see if you can find the smiley face. I, I'm going to be in the museum on Saturday and I'm definitely going to try to look. <laughs> Next slide, Kim. So this is um, a, a close up of the technique that Como used, which is a traditional Japanese technique to create these swirling colors in the ceramic. She needs the color into the raw clay uh, rather than applying the paint on the finished ceramic. Each component is created separately and then it's assembled together. This process creates a sort of an energetic flow of color and form and it appears to be moving and growing. In fact, the, culture, the sculpture has this sort of sense of continually changing form. Next slide, please. The artist finds her inspiration in the organic world, much like the traditional artists that Frida was just exploring. 
Her work is a synthesis of her deep contemplation of the forms that she sees in nature, just like her predecessor, predecessor Chinese artists. And interestingly, she does not uh, plan the work in advance, but it takes shape as she begins making it. It's based, it comes together based upon her intuition and, and personal feelings uh, at the time. Of this work, Kono described it, quote, I wanted to create a form which was born out of or came out of nothingness or a primordial state, end of quote. That primordial state appears to be water. The artist's explanation of the two points is, quote, the two horns refer to tips or points which tried to connect to the outside or something alien, end of quote. This particular work has great personal meaning for the artist. She created it during a period when she joyously gave birth to her first child and she tragically lost her father. To her, the changing shapes of nature represent the cycles of life. Can we go to the next slide, please, Kim? This is that samurai helmet that uh, was in the background of the photo that Frank took. This is displayed, as you could see, immediately after the creature and as you walk into the Japanese gallery. Um, and it's an elaborate ceremonial helmet for a high-ranking samurai created in the 1600s. And it's made of wood, lacquer, metal, and fiber. By displaying this helmet alongside of creature, the DI curators are tying the modern work's aquatic inspiration to traditional Japanese art. The helmet has three marine references. You've got that large clam on the front of the helmet. Then you have a reference to catfish in the back, that catfish tail, and also the fin on the top of the arc of the cap. Finally, uh, when you see it in person particularly, you'll notice that the surface shimmers as though light is hitting water. That effect is created by putting silver dust on damp black horror. These characteristics of referencing water were an important part of samurai philosophy. Water is the symbol of calming the mind before battle. At the time this helmet was made, an important samurai master taught, quote, the undisturbed mind is like a calm body of water, reflecting the brilliance of the moon. Employ, empty the mind and employ your soul, discover the undisturbed mind, end of quote. In, in other words, reflecting on water helps one focus on the presence and puts aside fears and anxieties. Christine, do, do we have any questions? If not, I'd like to move to Jill and our Buddhist art collection. Well, you just have a comment about how interesting all of this is and um, oh, right. su such a new and different uh, topic for us. Thank you. Terrific. Jill? Thank you. Okay. So now we're moving into the Buddhist gallery where Buddhist traditions are displayed. It's a truly cross-cultural space. The objects represent a time frame of 1500 years, right up to the present day, and they originate from regions stretching from Southeast Asia as far as Japan. And I want to thank Frida for bringing Buddhism into her presentation as well. So first some context about Buddhism. The Buddha was a real person, born in India in the mid-1400s BCE, before the Common Era. He was a prince of the Shaka clan, and he was born into luxury, therefore. However, he perceived that we humans become attached to unimportant transitory things that do not make us happy and which bring suffering. So he renounced his luxurious way of life. He lived like a monk. And for a time, he practiced extreme self-deprivation, which is what we see here in this small wooden sculpture. It's only 12 inches high, created in China in the 12 to 1300s. We see Shakyamuni 
as an emaciated figure. Just notice how the shin bone sticks out. He's bent over in thought and in a pose of self-absorbed meditation. He wears a monk's robe draped over one shoulder. By the way, you can walk around this piece and see at the back there's a small rectangular opening. Devotees would place special substances in this cavity, which transforms the sculpture into a devotional image itself. By the way, notice the elongated earlobes. As a prince, Shakyamuni would have worn heavy jeweled earrings, which extended his earlobes. And now, of course, he has renounced them. He spent a life of meditation in order to understand the true nature of reality. Once you have achieved this supreme insight into reality, you become enlightened and released from the endless cycle of death, suffering and rebirth. That is the aim of Buddhism. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at what we see. This is a very small sculpture from India. It's only about three and a half inches high, which is important because a devotee could easily carry it. It's obviously portable. Or it could be in a small roadside shrine. The sculpture is made of leaded brass and it dates back to the 1000s. By the way, adding lead to the brass makes it easier to work with. This is a Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. So what is a Bodhisattva? A Bodhisattva is one who is on the path to becoming a Buddha or a fully enlightened being and who is motivated by great compassion to help others. Let's have a look at the detail of the right hand. The right arm is extended and you'll see here how the right hand is open with the fingers pointing down. This would have been recognized as a universal gesture of generosity because is the embodiment of compassion, the personification of compassion. And so this universal gesture of generosity is open to all so the devotee could experience guidance and help. Next slide, please. Now we come to the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra in 8,000 verses, and it's on a palm leaf manuscript. This was created in Nepal about 1160, the language is Sanskrit. Now this manuscript contains the core teachings of the Buddha. His devotees therefore learn from it, but it's also considered to be an object of devotion in itself. The followers, his followers believe that it contains the actual words of the Buddha himself as written down by the devotees. The sutra defines the process for finding release from attachment to transitory values and therefore obtaining enlightenment. Now, palm leaves a palm leaf manuscript, not paper. Using palm leaves was a very common practice in South Asia. The leaves of a specific type of palm are cut down and dried in the sun. Once dry, they're stacked together and the bundle is cut into the desired shape using a special sharp knife. The oblong bundles are there compressed to make them flat. Next, the bundles are immersed in a vat of boiling water and boiled with herbs. For example, turmeric and natural lacquer. So this, they are colored and they have a coating. 
after they came Jill, to Jill, I have a yeah. question because this is yeah. fascinating. Is it, is it, is it, is it uh, when you see it, is it like a thick paper? It almost looks like a wood. Uh, it has a wood-like appearance. It does look like wood, but it is like a thick paper. And it's flexible as well. So, so it bends. Um, yes. Yes. It's quite thin. And the each leaf that we look at is actually quite small as well. It's about two or three inches, maybe three or four inches um, high and about 12 inches long. So after the palm leaf bundles are dried a second time, because now they've been boiled, lacquered, boiled, lacquered, compressed, now the writing is incised. So Ray, when I said quite thin, thicker than a piece of paper, for sure, because the writing is in size. Um, a special skilled person incises the lines and then the writing in great detail between the lines. And the lines and the writing are then infused with a black ink, usually carbon base. After that, the leaf is wiped clean. And so it's good to notice the incredible detail. Um, let's go to the next slide at this point. So I think this gives you a better idea of the detail. By the way, wood covers would enclose the whole manuscript. The manuscript is read by turning each separate leaf away from you. And all the leaves would be pegged or maybe tied together. So when you're reading it, you turn the leaves away from you. And I think we, we can see here, here we have an image of the enlightened Buddha in meditation, surrounded by two devotees. And then let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, throughout the manuscript, there are illustrations of stories from the Buddha's life. And at the top here, we see the story of how he was born directly from the side of his mother in a grove of trees in Lumbini in India, where he originated. And on the second slide, the, the bottom image, we see the enlightened Buddha in meditation. And I think you can just about see how his hand reaches down and touches the earth. And he, this is called calling the earth to witness. He touches the earth so that the earth can actually witness his enlightenment. By the way, the illustrations in the manuscript show various stories from the Buddha's life. A fun story, for example, is about a monkey who suffers, who offers the Buddha a bowl of honey. The Buddha accepts, and then the monkey dances for joy. Another tale is when Buddha and his disciples were wandering about, they were about to be attacked by a furious, maddened elephant. But then the elephant realizes who the Buddha is, and he calms right down and kneels in adoration. By the way, the DIA is very fortunate to have the complete sutra. There is only one other complete manuscript in the USA. Now, palm leaves are still sometimes used in places in Asia in relation to religious manuscripts. I'd like you to see this. Can you see this? Here is a yeah. palm leaf. Here is a palm leaf, part of a palm leaf manuscript that we have, that I have. 
and you can see how flexible it is. And maybe you can see that it's not very thick, thicker than paper. Um, but you can also, I think, see how it has defined lines, defined writing, and is extremely precise. Okay, so let's move on now to the Quran. So from palm leaves to paper. The images of a Quran created between 1450 and 1460. And it really does illustrate the value given to paper by the Chinese and the importance of sacred writings. The Quran is believed by Muslims to be the word of God as directly revealed to the prophet. Just by the way, as the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra is contended, considered to be the words of the Buddha. It's therefore appropriate that the Quran is created of the finest materials by the most gifted calligraphers. Now the one that we're looking at started out as a gift of paper from the Chinese emperor to the Timurid emperor. There were rolls of paper of 10 different colors, which you can see in the next slide. Each flecked with real gold and dyed with natural dyes. So these 10 different colors of paper are sent to the Timurid emperor from China. Now, I think you can see that although this paper is 600 years old, more or less, we can see that it is in near perfect condition. So how could that be? The Chinese had already been making paper for a long time. This paper has a high fiber content and is composed of bust, a material much like hemp and also possibly flax. The colors contain a lot of lead. And lead, of course, is poisonous, not only to people, but also to insects and to other creatures. I find it's fun to imagine how the paper would have traveled in stages along the Silk Road, probably as far as modern day Uzbekistan. After the Timurid Emperor's death, one of his sons acquired the paper because nothing had been done with it yet and commissioned an important calligrapher to create this presentation Quran for a mosque in present day Iran. We do not know who the calligrapher was, but in the Islamic world, calligraphy was considered the highest of the arts. You will see that there are gold decorations or lozenges in the margins. These mark every fifth and every 10th verse and are an aid to memorization. Some pages have elaborate illuminations in gold to introduce a new chapter. I suggest that the detail and precision of both the writing and exact spacing of the lozenges reflect the precision and care that we saw in the palm leaf manuscript. By the way, this particular Quran is not on view at the moment. It needed to be rested. There is yeah. a folio, however, yeah. Yeah, but it would be shown in the Islamic gallery, isn't that correct? Yes, it's shown in the Islamic yeah, right. gallery. Right. It just, and it just to clarify, you're showing you're showing the link and the similarities in cultural um, uh, religious text. Yes, and also noting that paper. You know, we went from palm leaves to paper, um, even though in India armies would be used and in other parts of Asia. Chinese invented paper long before. Um, there is, by the way, a oh. another Quran, Bukhara, Uzbekistan, in place of this Quran that I'm talking about. So if you do go, you can see similar paper flecked with gold in the Quran. That's on view. Okay. Next, please. 
Okay, so my last piece, we're moving to Tibet and the Buddhist wrathful deities tradition. This is a really great piece, by the way. In this tradition, the deity appears frightening and fierce, but that anger is aimed at destroying harmful influences such as ignorance and hatred. The deities assume terrifying forms. They must be more terrifying than what they're trying to destroy. Here we see Yamantaka, which means destroyer of Yama, the god of death in union with his partner Vajra Vitali. Symbolically, these images of union relate to enlightenment. The male represents compassionate action and the female embodies wisdom. So this union of wisdom and compassionate action symbolizes enlightenment and Buddhahood. Male and female are transcended. It's a great piece of work. Yeah. It is, um, and this is a terrifying looking uh, sculpture. Uh, it, yes. And it's so interesting to me because the first time I saw it, I thought it was something evil given my sort of Western upbringing and so forth that this is looks, looks satanic, for instance, or demon-like. Good, good point. But it's so interesting that this is actually a vehicle for good, uh, yes. a deity for good that looks so terrifying. It's inter interesting contrast. That's that's right. And so if if Yamantika is to destroy the fear and the god of death, then he has to be more frightening than death itself. And by the way, on the right of this piece here, we see the two faces of the consort and Yamantika really close together. They're in union, their legs are intertwined. Now, it is a fun piece to see, partly because you walk all around it and you can challenge yourself to count the legs and the arms and the hands and what those hands hold. It's not very large, by the way, maybe about 12 inches. It's incredibly detailed. And we can see traces of paint on the back of the heads and on the faces. Yamantika has nine heads. The very top one is the face of Manusri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom. And however, the first and biggest head has buffalo horns. And in this, you can see the buffalo horns at the bottom of the image and a buffalo face to be more frightening than Yama himself. And then if we go back to the heads, please. Thank you. Stay there. And then the very top one is the Bodhisattva, uh, who you are, who is to help people. Um, by the way, to save you counting, Yamantika has 34 arms and 16 legs and each arm holds a symbolic object. Uh, for example, one of the hands holds a curved knife to literally cut away layers of falsehood to reveal the truth. Um, so in the next slide, thank you, um, we see a detail, a close up of the foot and the legs. Yamantika's legs trample birds, animals, Hindu deities, which represent the defeated forces of ignorance because they've been crushed, they've been trampled. And I think in the right hand image here, I hope you can see that there is a human being who turns and holds his hand in a gesture of reverence towards Yamantika. And then as you walk around the the back of this piece, thank you, you can clearly see tusks, trunk, and skin in the shape of an elephant. I think you can see the tusks, uh, the shape dangling down to the right. Um, 
The flayed skin of the elephant represents the defeat of ignorance. What we cannot see is the hollow base of the sculpture. It's sealed shut underneath. But again, important substances, sacred substances, would have been put in there by a religious leader as part of consecrating this piece. The rituals of consecration invest this object with divine presence, so it would be very, very powerful. And indeed, the wrathful deities may only be seen by people who receive special teachings because of the power and strength of such pieces. Next slide, please. We can obviously see that it is incredibly detailed and I would encourage everybody to go and take a look. The craftsmen used the lost wax method, which has been known since ancient times. Basically, a clay model is made, coated with wax, and then another heat resistant substance, such as plaster, is molded over the wax. The whole is heated, dried out, and the wax, of course, melts, and after the hence lost wax, and then molten metal is poured into the mold to form the sculpture. The craftsman, the artist, breaks the mold and refines and polishes the metal object. So again, tremendous precision. All of the objects I've discussed, by the way, were created for devotional purposes. However, I really do believe that we can admire the attention to detail, the craftsmanship, and enjoy them as art. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. That was just fantastic. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have a few minutes yet, and we want to cover these last two pieces. Maya Andone created these ink on aluminum composite works, which recently joined the DIA's Asian collection. They are hung together in the back of the Buddhist gallery that Joe was just reviewing. On the left, the painting is called Como October, and on the right, it's just Como, and there's um, numbers associated with each. Both are four feet tall and four feet wide. Andone is an American artist of Japanese and Russian descent who is located in New York City. She is a 16th generation descendant of business sword makers. Business sword making began nearly a thousand years ago in a region of Japan which is rich in vital ingredients to produce superior swords. This rich tradition of precise craftsmanship of various Japanese cultures in the region has been passed down for many generations. Andone's work with metal is an obvious connection to her heritage. Next slide, please. Andone spent part of her childhood growing up in a Buddhist temple in Japan. She is a practicing Buddhist, and much of her work draws on Buddhist concepts, some of which we've been discussing today. These particular works are part of a series in which she just explores the idea of transitoriness or impermanence. It is a central tenet of the Buddhist philosophy that everything humans perceive in ordinary existence is impermanent ever changing. Next slide, please. Clouds provide an excellent analogy of this aspect of Buddhist philosophy. They constantly transform and they are made of inferior uh, substances that disappear. There is no sense of permanence. Even if you could touch clouds, uh, they can't be held but would slip through your fingers just as every moment can't be paused but moves to the next. Andone uh, replicate, replicates this quality of play of changing clouds with a light on metal, the way she creates it. As the viewer moves around the painting, the clouds seem to change in appearance. As the artist puts it, I employ the vocabulary of clouds as they are constantly shifting and changing by the moment, end of quote. In the Buddhist gallery, there is a bench in front of these works, which invites the visitor to pause and take time for contemplation. 
The works create a type of portal for the visitor to reflect upon their own experiences and existence. So that's uh, the last of our slides. Um, Christine, I don't think we have time for questions, do we? Well, we're right at two o'clock. Uh, we have one question. I don't know if we can answer it quickly or not, but Joe, there was a question about the last piece and um, about its, uh, what, what did that piece um, purposefully squash? What about, uh, say again, sorry. The last okay. piece and what it purposefully yes. squashed, you said it was the destroyer of, oh, what did oh, it purposefully ignorance. destroy? Ignorance. Ignorance. Thank yes. you. And false belief. Thank you so much. And as Christine said, uh, our hour is complete. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next month, we'll have part two of the Asian art, uh, which we will be uh, exploring two different galleries in the Asian wing. Next week is another virtual tour done by docents uh, Cindy and Tana. So I hope you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. It's uh, Through Her Eyes, Part 2, Women Photographers. I really want to thank our producers, Christine Marks and Kimmy. And as Amanda said, Kimmy is uh, departing the DIA, and we're going to miss her so much in everything she contributes, particularly her ability to uh, create the slides and find images. Thank you so much. Uh, stay well, and uh, hope we'll, hopefully we'll see you next week. Take care.